Hey guys, it's the Comics Kid 2099, and I am here to show you more of my graphic novel collection. I hope to finish this shelf in this video. I know I said that last time, but there are quite a few really huge hardcovers that won't take me as long because they take up a lot of space. And before I get to that, I wanted to show you this is the Iron Man Hero Clicks figure that I got for Free Comic Book Day. I showed you guys that on my Free Comic Book Day uh, video, and I didn't open it at that time, but then I thought, you know what, what's the point of having it if you're not going to get to look at it and see how cool it looks? And then I went ahead and found my Hulk Free Comic Book, well, no, I don't know. I got this one years and years ago. It was free, I know that, because I've never bought Heroclix stuff. I don't know what the circumstances were of me buying it. But as you can see, it actually, the base looks quite a bit different than the base over here. See, it's thicker right there, and it's not right there. So, yeah, I also had a Spider-Man one at one time, and then it sadly broke. So I don't know if I threw it away or what, but yeah. So those have been added to this shelf, and I think I showed you everything else that was on this shelf when I did a video last time on this shelf. So, having said that, I stopped right here after Doctor Strange Season 1. So that means the next book we will be talking about is New Universal. Everything went white. Now, long story short, in the 1980s, there was a series of books called The New Universe. And basically, it was a brand new universe. So, if Hulk could meet Iron Man or Spider-Man or Doctor Doom, then these characters in the new universe could not meet those characters. So you had one universe, which was the Marvel Universe, then you had the new universe. And that involved comics like Cyforce, uh, DP7, Night Mask. Uh, I haven't read a whole lot from those uh, comics. I've, I liked DP7 quite a bit. Um, the problem is Marvel hasn't collected a lot of that old stuff, so uh, that's, yeah, and I'm not even really here to talk about those. This, New Universal, was basically just a remake of the old New Universe stuff, and it's written by Warren Ellis, drawn by Salvador La Roca, and Warren Ellis said once, he said, basically, the idea behind the New Universe was a good idea, but he felt like it was all so connected that it really should have been happening in one giant book instead of four or five different separate titles. It should have all been one cohesive story. And so in a way, it's kind of like Heroes, where you've got all these people, they've got these superpowers, and they don't know each other yet, but they're slowly meeting each other. And there's some kind of goal on the horizon, but unfortunately this series was canceled i don't remember if it was a mini series that just ended prematurely or if it was an ongoing that ended prematurely but it was canceled i know there was another story set in this world written by ellis i think it was a prequel though it was called the pre-war years i believe or the post-war years i got this uh, discounted at my comic book shop a couple years ago and it was really enjoyable i enjoyed it but i've only read the first volume and i enjoyed it quite a bit so if you were a fan of the new universe back in the 80s and you're curious about this i would say give it a shot it's very different from the new universe but in my opinion it is highly enjoyable up next we've got marvel boy this was written by grant morrison and drawn by Somebody named Jones. I do not... Uh, J.G. Jones. Yeah, that's the guy who drew Final Crisis. This was written in the very, very early 2000s. Basically, this was Grant Morrison. According to him, this was his reinvention of the Spider-Man archetype. Uh, one time, he was asked, would he ever be interested in writing Spider-Man? And he said... Once upon a time, way back in the day, he did have some ideas for a Spider-Man story, but he said that basically you couldn't, nobody can ever do better than Steve Ditko and Stan Lee. And so he said he would rather do something like take that idea, the very angry teenager with superpowers, and you know do something different with it. 
And so that's what he did. Marvel Boy is a very angry teenager. He's out to change the world, literally. This is a very out there book. If you like Grant Morrison's more heady concepts, I would say definitely give this a shot. It's been a long time since I've read it, and I keep thinking to myself, I need to reread this and do a video on it, a full-blown video. I'm not saying that will happen. I'm saying I kept telling myself that I want to do this. Because I know sometimes I make promises about doing a video, and then it ultimately doesn't happen for a long time. But I would love to do a video on this one. And uh, if you're not aware, I am actually a pretty huge fan of Grant Morrison. I will typically go into just about anything he has written and give it a shot. And I enjoyed this. It was a lot of it, I think, went over my head when I read it. Maybe that would still happen again if I read it again. I'm not sure. Also, way back when the Ultimate Universe was first getting started, uh, Joe Casada said he had given a hint that there was another story that was set in the Ultimate Universe before Ultimate Spider-Man and Ultimate X-Men and the Ultimates. Those were the three founding series of the Ultimate Universe. And Joe Casada said, well, there was one more that was part of the Ultimate Universe, but I'm not going to tell you which one. A lot of people uh, think that it was this book, that uh, Marvel Boy was part of the Ultimate Universe unofficially. Of course, now that's a moot point because Brian Michael Bendis has used Marvel Boy in his New Avengers run. So it's not, it doesn't matter anymore if that was the intention because he is officially part of the 616 universe. But that's a little interesting note, if you will, that this was... Uh, at one point, it's very likely that it was part of the Ultimate Universe. We're not sure. That's never been confirmed, but that's the speculation. Now we've got Ghost Rider, Trail of Tears. I believe I talked about one of Garth Ennis's other Ghost Rider books, The uh, Road to Damnation or something like that. Uh, I really liked it. That was probably my favorite Ghost Rider book. Uh, incidentally, I've only got two Ghost Rider stories. This one and that other one. I am ordinarily not a gigantic fan of Garth Ennis. His work is very polarizing. You either love it or you hate it. There's really not a whole lot of middle ground. And I got this expecting something along the lines of The Road to Damnation, which was a very irreverent, very... It was a comedy story, basically. Like, it was a story about heaven and hell having a giant war in the present day, but there was a lot of comedic aspects to it. This is not that. This really feels a lot more like a Punisher story, where you've got this guy during the Civil War, and his family is killed, and so then he goes on a revenge quest. What I do remember is that this book really is not the same thing as Road to Damnation. If you have by any chance read that story, The Ghost Rider by Garth Ennis, this is not even a little bit the same. It's good. If you like the tragic western adventure action story, this has got a lot of that. And of course there's supernatural in it as well because it's a Ghost Rider story. But... It's not the same thing that Garth Ennis was doing, and I think that was, well, it's not a, you know, it's an easy mistake to make. If Garth Ennis was working on Ghost Rider, then he comes back to the title, you would think he'd be doing some of the same stuff. Not really the case. I may need to reread this. Knowing what is in store for me, I might have an entirely different opinion. This book is Avengers The Initiative Volume 2. I have Volume 1 somewhere. I don't know if I've already talked about it in one of my previous collection videos, but the reason this is here is because it's hardcover. The other one was paperback. I don't remember. if I must have ordered this online or I had gotten it for a birthday or something, but I wound up, I've got the first two volumes of Avengers The Initiative. One volume is in paperback. One volume is in hardcover. So it's here with the other hardcovers. This series, written by Dan Slott and Christos Gage, drawn by a couple of names that I do not recognize. I really enjoyed the first two volumes, I will say that. I really liked getting to see these new characters, getting to see their personalities, getting to see how they interact with each other. The big problem is that this is, the premise is superhero boot camp. After the Marvel Civil War, 
you've got all these, most of them are teenage superheroes who are training to be superheroes. Um, the government is like, okay, from now on, if you are a superhero, we're not going to let you just go out there and do whatever you want. So this was meant to be the training ground for superheroes so that they don't go out there and make a fool of themselves. The problem is, at the end of Volume 2, they all graduate, and they all go across the country to work in different states. And I've been told that the same characters are still featured somewhat in the subsequent volumes. The problem is, I don't care. Once the class graduates, I don't want to see Joe Schmo working in Arkansas and then another guy working in Texas. I don't care at that point. The team that I loved is no longer a team. It's just been scattered, and it's a lot like Grease 2. If you really love the movie Grease, I, I don't know why you would, if you really love the movie Grease, and then you find out they're making a sequel, you're going to be disappointed when you find out that it is an entirely new cast of characters going to the same school. And that's basically what Avengers The Initiative turned into. It could have held me. I could have been very interested in this series. The problem is, after two volumes, when you get rid of your entire cast and bring in a brand new cast, you're not going to keep me on board. I am not going to keep reading because is there any reason for me to keep reading? You're just going to replace your characters every 12 issues, and I won't have time to get invested in any of them. So, unfortunately, that is what is going on with Avengers The Initiative. Maybe some of you can talk, tell me in the comments if you've read that series before. Maybe you have better things to say than I do. The Hood. Blood from Stones. Written by Brian K. Vaughn, and I also don't recognize this artist. The Hood was a very early 2000s kind of it's a very interesting story it's of course it's a one of the max books so it's like a it's the equivalent of a hard rated r story so if you're you know a 15 year old maybe you don't need to read that um sorry but this story is a it's a super villain origin story i guess you could say because this guy he's not a hero in the traditional sense he's a He's a thief uh, slash uh, mobster, and he gets this uh, superpower through a device, if you will. And then it's kind of his story. Does he choose to act responsibly? Does he choose to make the right choice? And you're thinking, well, probably not, because he's a mobster. And it's interesting because he still retains a lot of that. He's kind of still not a he's not a 100% good person by the end of the book it's a I maybe just spoiled it a little too much um and this is the only story I've read with the hood I really enjoyed it um I from what I understand he is this character was used by again Brian Michael Bendis in his new Avengers run and from what I understand he changed quite a bit of what the character was here to use him in New Avengers. I haven't read that stuff, so I can't speak to that for certain, but that's what I understand, that as a rule of thumb, Brian Michael Bendis will take a character that hasn't been used a whole lot, so The Hood, Marvel Boy, The Sentry, and he will dust them off and use them in his own run. Nothing wrong with that. It it gives this, these characters spotlight, if you will. People who might not have been interested in the hood, they might go back and read this story because they saw him in the Avengers comic. What becomes problematic is when Brian Michael Bendis will write these characters in a way that they were not written before. Now, I know that he did that with Marvel Boy. I think he did that with the hood. I'm not certain, though. I would have to look into it, and frankly, I'm just not that interested in the Avengers to look into it. This is another one that I really kind of think I should reread. It's been several years since I read it, and I think I would enjoy it if I read it again. Captain Marvel, Secret Invasion. This one, I think, is another one that I got discounted somewhere at my, probably at my local comic book shop, and... I have not read the main Secret Invasion title. I've read a, one or two issues from it, really didn't like it. I got this, and I really enjoyed it. This was a story that, um, well, it's been a little while, and it's going to be hard for me to talk about this without spoiling it, so if you haven't read it, 
uh, just go ahead and skip to when I talk about this book over here. If you're still here, I assume you don't care about spoilers. Captain Marvel was a character who died in the 1980s. He died of cancer. And he is probably the only comic book character who, after dying, has not come back. Uh, the only one I can think of other than him would be Gwen Stacy and Uncle Ben. And I'm certain that there is a story where both of those characters have been brought back. Captain Marvel. This, of course, was in the uh, late-ish 2000s after Secret Invasion. And this guy is, spoiler, not the real Captain Marvel. He is actually a scroll who has been programmed to think that he is the real Captain Marvel. And so it's a very interesting story of, well, this guy, he's working for the bad guys, or he was one of the bad guys, and now he thinks he's one of the good guys. And it's, in a lot of ways, it's pretty much the same premise as the old Captain Marvel stuff. Captain Marvel was an agent of the Kree, and they were not good guys. And then he comes to Earth, and he basically becomes one of the good guys. He says, yeah, I, uh, I like it here. I don't want to betray the people of Earth. It's the same premise, but it's a different species. It's really interesting stuff. I, uh, I really liked it quite a bit. Brian Reed wrote this. Uh, my only issue with it is we didn't get more of this Captain Marvel with Brian Reed. I would have loved to have seen an ongoing series with the scroll Captain Marvel. I don't know what happened to this character. I know right now we've got Carol Danvers as Captain Marvel, but I don't know what happened to this guy. I'm sure he died or something, but um, yeah, I liked it. Uh, maybe not for everybody, but I, I thought it was really good. I have done a video on Timestorm 2099. I did that a couple months ago, I think. So I probably am not going to talk about it much here. Basically, if you see my username, then you know I'm a big fan of the 2099 universe. And this was another attempt at revamping that, sort of. The problem with the 2099 comics, I will say 2099 or 2099, the problem with those comics is that ever since that universe ended in the late 90s, every time they've tried to go back to that brand, they've instead of returning to that universe, they just create a brand new universe that slightly resembles the old one. Oddly enough, this is written by Brian Reed. Whereas I really love the Captain Marvel Secret Invasion book that he wrote, I wasn't a huge fan of this, as you probably remember from seeing the video that I did. So I'm not going to talk about this one much more because I've already done a video on it. This is Mark Wade's Fantastic Four run. I think you can get this run in four volumes of trade paperbacks. Uh, for some reason, my the hardcovers are in three volumes. This is a really fantastic run on the Fantastic Four. No pun intended. I really was not meaning a pun there. It's simply glorious. Before this run on the Fantastic Four, the Fantastic Four was doing okay. They weren't just knocking it out of the park. And I've, I've read some of the stuff that predated this. And like I say, it wasn't awful. It just wasn't really spectacular. Um, in my opinion, when you go to the Fantastic Four, you want to see them do stuff that you cannot see in any other comic book. And the problem with that is you can only push the envelope so far before you, you know, you've pushed it where you've already pushed before, if you will. I really think that despite that, Mark Wade does things in this run that I have not seen any other writer do on a comic book before. Not e not just a Fantastic 4 comic, but just a comic book period. It's a really amazing run. I know I just going through the adjectives right now, trying to think of things to say about it. If you are curious about the Fantastic Four, if you're thinking, well, should I uh, should I read the Fantastic Four? I would say the first volume of his run, I think, is called Imagine Knots. I would seek that out, buy it, read it, see what you think. It's really great. Mark Wade really understands the Fantastic Four. Uh, I really wish he could have just stayed on the book a lot longer, but. Sadly, it was not meant to be. So, I've, I've got this whole run here. You know what? I know I keep saying this, but that's another run that I might need to think about doing a video for. I'm not saying it will happen, but I might need to think about it. Then we've got two volumes of Bruce Jones' The Incredible Hulk. Now, I've got a few Hulk books here, as you can see. 
but his run on the Hulk was actually probably one of the first that I read. I haven't read much Hulk. I read the John Byrne run. I've got Planet Hulk here, and then uh, what I've read of Bruce Jones's run. My big issue with this is that Marvel d has not put out the rest of this run in these hardcovers. There is enough of Bruce Jones's run to put into at least another hardcover that's the size of these two, probably two more. And after volume two here of the hardcovers, the rest of it is collected in these really short trade paperbacks, like four issues long. And usually a trade paperback is just a little longer than that, five or six issues. And I just, I really wish Marvel would just have put the whole run in, in hardcovers like they did here with Mark Wade's Fantastic Four. This is a really good run on the Hulk. I liked it a lot. A lot of people, I think, didn't like it. I know for, like, the first several issues, you don't really see a lot of the Hulk. I didn't mind that. In that time, you're getting used to Bruce Banner. You're getting to know him as a character, which, for me, I hadn't read a whole lot of the Hulk, so I was fine with that. It, it allowed me to get used to him. And you're also getting used to some of the subplots that are being set up, some of the supporting characters and antagonists. I really look forward to reading the rest of this run. I've got a couple of the trades. I'm just missing the story that comes immediately after what's collected here. But I will definitely read the rest of this run. And I recommend if you see an Incredible Hulk run, uh, it, it'll have a cover that looks like that or that. Uh, if you see any Hulk comics by Bruce Jones, pick them up. They are incredible. And once again, I've returned to Punville. Um, I really love Bruce Jones' run on the Hulk. And now that I think of it, I think Marvel might be putting those back in hardcover print, but they're not the same hardcovers as these. So, like, the numbering would be different, and I don't like that. But at least Marvel is recognizing that this run is deserving of being collected and given to the audiences in the form of... Uh, hardcover trades and stuff. The next book we have here is Planet Hulk. You've probably heard of it. Um, I really love this book. It's not exactly original. There was a run of The Incredible Hulk in the 70s, which I have not read, where The Incredible Hulk was shrunken down and was living in the microverse for a little while. And he was he fell in love with this princess named Jarella and then something happened i don't remember if that world was destroyed or if he was just you know returned to his normal size so he couldn't go back planet hulk is from what i understand quite similar to that story i despite that i enjoyed this probably because i wasn't aware that there was a story that was similar to this this story was basically put together because the Marvel Civil War was going on at the time, and the writers were like, well, whichever side Hulk is fighting for, that's an unfair advantage, so we need to get Hulk off the planet so that we can have our Civil War. And, you know what, that's kind of uh, nonsensical thinking, I think. That's one of those things where it's like editorial mandate dictates what kind of stories are told. However, if it results in stories like Planet Hulk, I am totally okay with it. I really had a lot of fun reading this book. I haven't read it in a long time. I've seen the animated movie a couple times since I read this, but that's one that I would love to just read again. Even if I didn't do a review on it, I would just love to read it again. It's a lot of fun. You have a lot of fun with Planet Hulk, and then you have Fall of the Hulks, which I got that, I think, the cover price is like $40. I got it, I had a discount. Um, well, it doesn't say the price over here. Oh no, yeah, it's $40. I had a coupon to my local Books A Million that was 50% off something that was like over $25. And I was in a Hulk mood, so I got this. It was the biggest Hulk book that was at the Books A Million, and I thought, this looks like it could be a lot of fun. And it was not. Guys, I don't think I can put into words how awful Fall of the Hulks was. I would tell you that I would just... I, I'm not even going to get into it. It was so incredibly bad. And I really hope I never have to look at this book again, guys. So 
it was awful. You'll please just take my word for it. If you don't take my word for it, maybe you you'll, you'll want to read it. But I'm trying to save you from having to pay the forty bucks for that book because, folks, it was really not that good. Secret War. This is by Brian Michael Bendis. I don't remember who the artist is. This is not to be confused with the 1980s Secret Wars miniseries. This is a spy superhero story where the long story short is that Nick Fury has recruited several superheroes to invade Latveria. And then the story kind of deals with the aftermath of that. You know, uh, what happens to these heroes whenever they do something like that? What happens to the planet's economy? That sort of thing. And it's an okay book. It's a Brian Michael Bendis event, I guess you could say. It's not quite an event like Secret Invasion or Civil War, but it's, you know, a big, huge story. I get the feeling that it's one of those things... I probably should have read all of Secret Invasion. I probably should have read Brian Michael Bendis' Avengers run to really understand the full scope of what was going on here. I didn't read those stories. I don't regret it because I'm I'm never going to read Brian Michael Bendis' Avengers run. I don't care enough about the Avengers to do that. So that book, it was okay. It was, you know... If, in a lot of ways, it feels like an incomplete story because it just kind of, it happens. There's definitely, it has an impact on the Marvel Universe, but I get the feeling that this is like the, the conclusion of the story happens elsewhere and I haven't read the conclusion. Jack Kirby's Galactic Bounty Hunters. This is actually not written by Jack Kirby. This is written by his daughter, I believe Lisa, and... This was done by Marvel in the 2000s, and in the back of the book, they've got, like, all this concept art, like, unfinished pitches and stuff that Jack Kirby did before he died, and a lot of it kind of looks kind of cool. Some of it looks really ridiculous, if I'm being honest, but some of it looks really amazing, and there was all these promises of, you're going to get to see stories of all of these pitches that Jack Kirby did before he died, and it will be like his kids will be fleshing out these stories, and that uh, artists who are friends of Jack Kirby before he died, they will be doing these stories, and it never happened. Uh, this book was from 2006. It's been seven years, and as you probably know, there hasn't been a sequel to Jack Kirby's Galactic Bounty Hunters. There probably never will, because... If you keep up with the news, Jack Kirby's kids have sued Marvel Comics a couple of times since this book. And I really, that made me think a lot less of the Kirby children because Marvel, basically, they let the Kirbys have all the rights to this. Like, this is one of those things that Marvel printed the comic and then the kids got all of the proceeds. There wasn't something where Marvel, because they printed a comic, they got a portion of it. No, the Kirby family got everything, that all the profits for this book. Marvel basically did them a solid and said, yeah, we'll print this for you. And then the Kirby kids turn around and they sue Marvel Comics. You may have a different view on that. Um, I know I kind of have a controversial view on just that whole topic as a whole, but Honestly, it seemed really bad form when after Marvel did the Kirby kids a favor, they turned around and they sued Marvel. I just thought that was really poor taste. Um, not a great decision on their part. But this story by itself, I haven't really talked about the quality of it. It's not that good, unfortunately. It's really fun getting to see characters that were designed by Jack Kirby and getting to see them drawn in a somewhat Kirby style. However, the story itself is really slow moving, and it's just not that great of a story, unfortunately. I may do a video on it someday. I've read this story twice, so if I'm going to do a video on it, it's going to be a long time from now when I'm just running out of other things to do, because I have read this one twice, and I don't feel like reading it a third time in order to do a video but you know you might you never know you might see a video of it someday Marvel Apes I remember when this was announced everyone and their mom started throwing poop at Marvel Comics because they were like this is a stupid idea why are you doing this Meh. and 
I was really, I didn't understand it because everyone loves the Marvel Zombies thing and I personally thought Marvel Zombies was a waste of space, didn't deserve to exist at all. This was actually a very clever story. This involves a character, it involves him going through changes as a character, as every story should, and it also has a neat twist ending in it. I will not tell you the twist. If you want to know the twist, go buy Marvel Apes, because it has the, the twist in it. And this was just a really fun story. Now, there was a sequel. I don't remember what the sequel was called. The Evolution Continues, maybe. And if I'm being very honest, the sequel was not any good. Marvel Apes won really solid stuff. The sequel, whatever it was called, uh, do not buy it because... I didn't like it. Uh, wow, that sounded really conceited, didn't it? In my humble opinion, the sequel was not any good. So if you value my opinion, I would say don't buy the sequel to Marvel Apes. And now this book here, The Complete Frank Miller. You probably want to see Frank Miller's rendition of Spider-Man. That's him. It's kind of interesting. When I bought this, I was expecting something like... Frank Miller's Daredevil, or, you know, The Dark Knight Returns. Not quite that dark, but I was expecting something along those lines. This is not that. The Frank Miller Spider-Man book is basically just a series of unconnected Spider-Man stories that Frank Miller happened to be on. This was from a time when Frank Miller was not the superstar artist that he is now. He was just drawing occasional issues, and even his art just isn't quite what you expect it to be. His art is more traditional. It's less Frank Millery in what you see there. And I think one issue here is actually uh, written by Frank Miller and is not drawn by him. It's a fun collection, but if you're expecting a series of stories that... Uh, all connect with each other and are back to back to back and you're expecting you know the Frank Miller experience on Spider-Man you're probably going to be disappointed this book does not give you that what it does give you is some really fun Spider-Man comics from the late 70s and I enjoyed it now I'm not a huge Spider-Man fan but what I saw here I really enjoyed a lot this book here the ultimate Galactus trilogy this was three miniseries. I think Ultimate Secret, Ultimate Nightmare, and Ultimate Extinction. And the story is, it introduces a whole bunch of characters to the Ultimate Universe that before this book, we had not seen them before. And honestly, I didn't care a great deal for it. There's some neat ideas here, but I think that this story had a lot of potential and just didn't really meet that potential. That was my big problem with it. You know, it probably deserves to be up here with all the other Ultimate books, but I have it down here. So I'll move it after this video. Like I say, this has got Galactus in it. It's got a version of the Silver Surfer. Not THE Silver Surfer, because the something that more closely resembles the Silver Surfer later appeared in Ultimate Fantastic Four, and they tried to explain that away as saying like, well, there's, there's, you know, this is why it happened. Uh, you also get Misty Knight, um, you get the Vision. Um, some, you know, it gives you a lot of characters who had not been in the, Mar in the Ultimate Universe before. It's still, like I say, I think the best thing I can say about it is it had a lot of potential, and it didn't meet that potential. Uh, the final book is, 1602. This was written by Neil Gaiman and drawn by one of the Kubert brothers. I don't remember which one, either Andy or uh, Adam. And basically, from what I understand, Neil Gaiman wrote this to fund his legal battle with Todd McFarlane. And that is a video topic all on its own, but basically he did this so that he could have a lot of money so that he could hire lawyers to help him in court against uh, Todd McFarlane. And that's really what you need to know. So that seems like a very cynical reason for this story to exist. I didn't know that that was the reason that the book existed when I first read it. I haven't read it in a long, long time, but I enjoyed this book quite a bit, despite the fact that 
you know, its very cynical reasons for existing, it's a pretty fun story. The basic premise is that the Silver Age of Marvel Comics is happening in the year 1602. However, in the 1960s, you basically had all the characters were on the same side. You might have an issue where Spider-Man fights the Hulk or the Avengers are trying to capture the Hulk, but for the most part, everyone was on the same side. Here, you've got the very early form of America in the colonies. Then you've got King James, who's kind of sort of a bad guy. You've got some people who are working for King James. Then you've got some people who are very much against him. And it kind of puts a political bent on the story. I am not usually a fan of incorporating politics into comic books. I am firmly in the camp that believes that politics is a very real world thing and that comic books in my humble opinion are an escapist form of literature and that if I'm going to escape from the real world I don't want something like politics following me into comics. However, I am not quite familiar with the politics of the 1600s so this was very educational and it also didn't feel as much like I wanted to throw up, like I do when I hear about stuff that involves politics now. The basic core idea, I guess, is that, like I said, the Silver Age of Marvel is happening in the year 1602, and it's not supposed to. So these characters are kind of sort of trying to figure out why this is happening. And it's a very interesting idea, I think. There's some really amazing character work, I think. It's one of those things kind of like... DC Comics will do an Elseworld story, and the idea is, well, this is more or less the same character who exists in a different time and place, and it really does give you the idea, well, how would these characters differ if they didn't exist in the time and place that they exist now? Some of them are very different, and some of them, they really do feel like the same character, just in a different time and place, and it's really fun. I know there were a couple sequels, I have not read them. One of them was more or less a straight up sequel that was set in the American colonies, and it kind of delved into some of the characters who didn't get a chance to show up in this book. The other one was just a straight up Fantastic Four spinoff involving the four from here, and I haven't read it either. I kind of want to, but I just didn't feel like I was in a big hurry to read those when I first read this. It's a very interesting story. I would recommend it, but like I say, I haven't read it in a very long time, so I could read it now, and it could just be that I loved it when I was a teenager, and that I wouldn't love it as much now. And that is my look at this shelf. I, it took me a long time to talk about it, but I finally did. And so the next time I do one of these collection videos, I will probably do something else. Probably not Marvel-related, because I don't have a whole lot of I don't have another full shelf of Marvel stuff. I hope you guys enjoyed this video, and I will be back tomorrow with some other kind of uh, review in a video. So, I will see you then.